All right. Uh, airway management. Uh, as we learn to assess patients, our assessments begin with, uh, when we actually reach the patient, begin with um, the ABCs, uh, with airway being the um, first thing that we assess, then the effectiveness of breathing, and then the effectiveness of circulation, looking for immediate life threats. We'll get into that when we uh, discuss our uh, patient assessment lectures coming up soon. Uh, but first, we want to talk about airway management. And I've divided it into two parts. Part one will be looking at the airway physiology as well as the airway pathophysiology, talking about methods to open the airway. Um, it doesn't do any good if we can't get air into the lungs because of an airway obstruction, whether that be from a foreign body uh, or the most common airway obstruction, the tongue. And then we'll look at a couple uh, airway adjuncts that as an EMT you would have access to, uh, to include the uh, oropharyngeal airway and the nasal pharyngeal airway. Now the upper airway begins with the mouth and the nose, and as you take a breath in, the air is warmed, it's humidified uh, in the nasal turbinates uh, in the nose. Uh, the air then ends up into the pharynx, or what we know as the throat. And it's actually made up of the oropharynx, the nasopharynx, and the laryngopharynx. Um, and then the upper airway ends at the glottic opening, or the opening to the trachea. And here is just uh, a, uh, a diagram of the uh, upper airway, uh, where air... Um, is taken in through the nose, and as it passes through these turbinates, uh, it becomes warm, it becomes humidified, uh, the nasal hairs uh, filter out uh, perhaps some of the dust and particulates uh, so they don't end up down into the lungs. Uh, the air then travels back to the pharynx um, where it has to get by the tongue, uh, and uh, the upper airway then ends at the glottic opening. Uh, that is protected by uh, the epiglottis. The lower airway begins below the larynx. And the larynx is your voice box. Uh, in males, the Adam's apple is quite dominant, and that is uh, the actual uh, larynx. Um, the lower airway is composed of the trachea, a uh, rigid tube um, that divides into a left and right main stem bronchi that divide into smaller bronchi that divide into terminal bronchioles that are surrounded and covered by air sacs called alveoli. Um, so that lower airway begins below the voice box. There's the trachea with the cartilage bands that keep it rigid so it doesn't collapse. Uh, at the area known as the carina, the trachea divides into a left and right main stem bronchus, and they divide into smaller bronchi, and eventually into terminal uh, bronchioles uh, that are covered with uh, air sacs. Now, as we had mentioned, the air sacs are called alveoli, and they're tiny sacs in a grape-like bunch at the end of the airway, and they are surrounded by pulmonary capillaries that uh, bring uh, blood uh, to the alveoli uh, for gas exchange. Um, now, the capillaries are single-celled membranes Capillaries are single cell membranes that um, allow the red blood cell one at a time to pass through there, uh, and the red cell gives off uh, CO2 uh, into the alveoli and picks up uh, oxygen, and that way the um, gases diffuse across uh, the capillaries into the alveoli, allowing for gas exchange. Excuse me, now here is an example of uh, the uh, terminal bronchioles uh, surrounded by the uh, alveoli. It's estimated that the average lung has about 700 million alveoli. Um, they're not all distended and full of air all the time. Um, obviously, uh, when we uh, exercise or move or 
uh, our body requires us to breathe deeper and faster to supply oxygen to the tissues. Uh, we use more lung space than if we're just resting quietly or sleeping. Now, uh, when we are quiet and sleeping or resting, um, some of these alveoli collapse, and that's known as atelectasis. Um, if enough of these alveoli collapse, then we don't exchange oxygen well, and um, our body will um, try to re-expand these alveoli, and we see that in people when they sigh. Uh, a sigh or a yawn uh, are modified forms of respiration uh, that allow the lungs to re-expand some of those alveoli that have collapsed. Now there's a variety of obstructions that will interfere with airflow getting into the lungs and uh, they include foreign bodies um, which could be a food, could be a small toy or a, a piece off a toy. They also include liquids like blood or vomit can obstruct the airway. Uh, and obstruction uh, may also be the result of poor muscle tone caused by an altered mental status. So when a person has an altered mental status, in other words, they're not awake and oriented, and they're lying flat on their back, the tongue is a, a rather large muscle, and when it becomes uh, flaccid or um, when the muscle tone is lost due to unconsciousness, it has a tendency to drop on the back of the throat, and causing a uh, partial to complete airway obstruction. Uh, when it partially obstructs the airway, we hear the noise snoring. Um, obstructions can be acute, meaning suddenly, um, as in a case of vomiting or blood, uh, or obstructions can be uh, chronic or long-term obstructions, like uh, with uh, sleep apnea. Uh, as a EMT, it's important that uh, we initially evaluate the airway for patency to make sure that it is open and there are no foreign bodies obstructing it so that we can get air into the lungs. But we also have to monitor that patency over time. In critical patients, we want to reassess the airway at least once every five minutes and in non-critical patients at least once every 15. Um, Acute airway obstructions, as we've already mentioned, could be foreign bodies, vomit, or blood. And airway obstructions can also occur over time, as in the case of burns. Um, burns swell. And initially, uh, if you breathe in superheated air, you may burn your airways uh, during a, you know, if you're caught in a house fire where the air is extremely hot. Uh, in addition to the toxins that you breathe in, you may also b burn the airways. And um, initially they may be okay, but over time uh, they begin to swell. Uh, trauma, you may uh, strike your throat on the steering wheel during a motor vehicle collision. Uh, and uh, uh, soft tissue swelling will occur over time. And infections like uh, epiglottitis. Uh, where the soft tissue around the epiglottis uh, swells over time as the result of either a viral or bacterial infection. Um, these uh, swellings of the upper airway uh, will lead to a sound called strider. Uh, strider is an inspiratory noise uh, that you hear when the patient takes a breath in. Um, and then with a decreased mental status, uh, you can have an airway obstruction from the tongue. Now you can also have obstruction of the bronchi. Um, it could be the result of a um, disorder of the lower airway where the smooth muscle constricts and the internal diameter of the bronchi become much smaller. Uh, oftentimes uh, these disorders, the most common being asthma, uh, cause bronchoconstriction, and in addition to uh, narrowing of the bronchial passages, they also have a tendency to um, uh, fill up with mucus. Uh, so we can see this in what we call uh, chronic obstructive pulmonary diseases, like asthma, like emphysema, like chronic bronchitis.
the airway is assessed uh, addressed in the primary assessment as I mentioned earlier in the beginning of the lecture but as you're assessing the airway two questions that have to be answered is is the airway open and then will it stay open um, you know sometimes the airway may be open but if the patient is unresponsive, lying flat on her back, uh, it may become obstructed by the tongue. Uh, in most patients, uh, you can determine whether or not the airway is open simply uh, by introducing yourself and saying hello. Um, if uh, the patient responds back to you uh, and talks, then you know that their airway is open. Um, in patients who are having trouble getting air in to their lungs, they may position their head in what's called the sniffing position. And you'll see this in patients who have uh, swelling uh, uh, of the upper airway, uh, where they tip their head slightly back as if to sniff something. Uh, this uh, aligns the, uh, uh, the airway structures uh, so there's more of a straight shot for the air to go directly down the uh, trachea. Um, some things that you might find that would indicate that a person is having breathing problems uh, might be their inability to speak. Uh, if they uh, can't speak at all, then they may have a complete airway obstruction like you learned in basic life support. Um, if they have an unusual raspy quality to their voice or a very hoarse voice, uh, that may indicate an airway obstruction. Strider, as I've already mentioned, an inspiratory noise um, that sounds like this. <coughs> and again, you hear that in patients who have upper airway obstruction. Snoring from the tongue and gurgling in the back of the mouth from fluid that's accumulating in the back of the mouth while the patient breathes. Um, in answering the question, will the airway stay open, keep in mind that the, the assessment of the airway is not just a one-time thing. Uh, it's a dynamic process uh, that you have to give constant consideration to. Um, it's something that you need to check and recheck. Uh, the most common cause of death en route to the hospital is an overlooked airway obstruction. Uh, signs that a person has an inadequate airway or that their airway is either partially or completely obstruction, obstructed uh, include no signs of breathing or air movement, uh, evidence of a foreign body in the airway where you can actually see the foreign body. Uh, when you look, listen, and feel to see if they're breathing, uh, you don't feel any air, nor do you hear any air move in and out of their airway. If a person is having difficulty speaking or not able to speak at all, um, again, that unusual hoarse or raspy bo voice, uh, or absent, minimal, or uneven chest rise uh, would indicate an adequate airway as well. Uh, some other signs uh, would be abdominal breathing. Uh, typically, we breathe with uh, both our abdominal, our, our diaphragm, uh, and our intercostal muscles between our ribs. The diaphragm flattens, the intercostal muscles contract, pulling the rib cage up and out, making the chest rise. Um, if for some reason I have a um, uh, spinal cord injury, uh, it could uh, prevent my intercostal muscles from working at all and I would just breathe with my abdominal muscles or excuse me the diaphragm. Uh, in this case uh, the chest appears to sink in while the uh, abdomen uh, distends outward. Um, you see it primarily in young children who haven't developed their intercostal muscles, muscles very well. Uh, they will uh, have this seesaw abdominal breathing. Uh, when you're listening to lung sounds with your stethoscope, a uh, sign that the airway may be inadequate is diminished or absent breath sounds, uh, or you may hear abnormal noises like, like wheezing, which is a whistling that we hear with uh, asthma, uh, crowing and strider, snoring and gurgling we've already talked about, uh, or gasping during their breathing. Breathing should not be um, difficult, uh, it should not hurt, and we shouldn't be making lots of noise when we breathe either. Uh, 
Um, in children and infants, one indicator of an inadequate airway is nasal flaring. Uh, the cartilage of their nares is quite undeveloped, and as a result, when children start to work hard to breathe, then <coughs> you'll see nasal flaring. You'll also see retractions above the clavicles as the um, sternal clitomastoid muscles uh, are used to help um, ventilate the patient or help get air into the lungs. Um, when the primary assessment indicates an inadequate airway, that is a life-threatening condition. It requires us to take prompt action to open the airway and to maintain it. Uh, if the airway is not open, we have to position the patient to open it. Um, we also have to keep in mind that if the patient has head, neck, or spinal cord injury, uh, that um, we have to open their airway a, a special way. The most common method of opening the airway is called the head tilt chin lift maneuver, which you learn in basic life support, and then the jaw thrust maneuver. Both of these move the airway structures into a position allowing for air movement. Both of these, when performed properly, lift the tongue up off the back of the throat by displacing the jaw towards the ceiling or lifting the jaw up off the back of the throat. The tongue is attached to the lower jaw, and by uh, moving it upward, uh, it does open the airway, uh, allowing for a clear passage to the lungs. So here's an example of the head tilt chin lift, uh, where you place one hand on the forehead, uh, two fingers under the bony prominence of the chin, not the soft tissue, and you lift the chin up towards the ceiling. Um, or up towards yourself, uh, allowing the lower jaw to move upward and raising the tongue up off the back of the throat. Um, and that's what this is essentially just saying. You place one hand on the patient's forehead, the fingertips of the other hand, in the center of the patient's lower jaw on the bone, not the soft tissue. Pressing on the soft tissue may actually obstruct the airway. Tilt the head back, lift the chin, uh, and do not allow the mouth to close. Now, the jaw thrust maneuver is a little more challenging. Uh, the jaw thrust maneuver is uh, where you uh, have a patient who has spinal cord injury or you suspect based on the mechanism that they may have spinal cord injury. Uh, in other words, uh, this may be an unresponsive patient that you've removed from a motor vehicle where the windshield was starred. Um, uh, you know that that starred windshield was caused by this patient's head, and uh, they may, in fact, uh, have um, a spinal cord injury. So we don't want to hyperextend their head uh, in the event of a spinal cord injury. So we're just going to uh, place our thumbs on the cheekbones and use our fingers to grab the jaw uh, by the ear and lift the jaw upward. Keep the patient's head, neck, uh, and spine aligned. Uh, moving the patient as a unit into a supine position, lying flat on her back. Kneel to the top of their head. Place one hand on each side of the patient's lower jaw uh, by the ears. And then raise that jaw up off the back of their throat, allowing the airway to open. You may use your thumbs uh, to retract the patient's lower lip in order to keep their mouth open. But once you're in that position to um, open the airway with a jaw thrust, that's where you stay. Uh, even when we talk about these uh, upcoming adjuncts to help keep the tongue up off the back of the throat, we still need to maintain good head tilt chin lift or good jaw thrust. So the airway person, uh, you know, that may, if that's what you're doing, that becomes your job. And if you let go of the airway, the patient will uh, become obstructed. Um, airway position and maneuvers are certainly short-term solutions. Uh, there are other adjuncts that we can use for longer term, uh, adjuncts that can help keep the airway open. And as a uh, EMT, the two most common airway adjuncts are going to be the oropharyngeal airway and the nasal pharyngeal airways. The names uh, imply the oropharyngeal airway will fit into the mouth, the nasal pharyngeal airway will fit into the nose. <clears throat> 
Now, in using these airways, uh, you can only use an oropharyngeal airway in a patient who doesn't exhibit a gag reflex. If you put an OPA into somebody's mouth and they start gagging, you need to remo remove it because leaving it in, allowing them to gag and retch, could cause them to vomit and they could aspirate that vomit into their lungs. Um, you want to open the patient's airway with a head tilt chin lift or a jaw thrust before you put the device in. Um, and then when inserting the airway, take care not to push the patient's tongue or wad the tongue up in the back of the throat. So we'll talk specifically about the method of insertion that would um, prevent wadding the tongue up in the back of the throat. You need to have suction ready as well, and we'll talk about suction in part two of airway management. Um, because the patient may gag, the patient may vomit, um, and if they do start to gag, don't continue to insert the airway. Uh, even with the airway in place, you still need, need to maintain good head tilt, chin lift, or jaw thrust. Um, again, have that suction ready to be able to suction uh, fluid or blood that may obstruct the airway. If the patient regains consciousness, they're going to develop a gag reflex, and uh, they're going to... Uh, remove it themselves. That's typically how I know they need it is I put it in and they don't fight it, they don't gag, uh, and how I know it needs to come out is they'll often reach up, grab it, and pull it right out of their mouth. Um, you want to, this isn't a sterile technique by any means, but you certainly want to be wearing gloves, maybe perhaps eye protection uh, when putting in airway adjuncts. Um, maybe even a face shield if you think there's going to be coughing or spitting or vomiting. Uh, the oropharyngeal airway is a device used to move the tongue forward as it curves back to the pharynx. It comes in a variety of different sizes. Uh, and This happens to be a, a Beerman oropharyngeal airway. That's the style where it has a channel running down each side. Um, and here you can see the different sizes of the airway. And the airway needs to be sized. Uh, if the airway is too short, it's just going to wad the tongue up in the back of the throat. If the airway is too long, it could uh, push the epiglottis closed, causing a complete airway obstruction, or it may end up in the esophagus, dilating the esophagus and allowing air to go into the stomach. So in order to measure it, uh, you measure it uh, from the corner of the mouth, uh, to the angle of the jaw or the tip of the ear. Uh, if it reaches those two landmarks uh, from the corner of the mouth, then uh, it is the properly sized airway. There's another way of measuring it from the corner of the mouth to the tip of the ear. Now, when you insert an or oropharyngeal airway, obviously the patient is on their back, the patient is deeply unconscious, the patient has no gag reflex. Uh, you're going to open your mouth, open their mouth with a cross finger technique, and then position the airway with the tip pointing toward the roof of the mouth. So you're going to put it in backwards initially. So there's the cross finger technique to open their airway. Uh, and then you slide the device along the roof of the mouth till you get to the base of the tongue, at which time you're going to rotate it 180 degrees so the tip is pointing down into the throat. Um, and then position your patient with a head tilt, chin lift, or jaw thrust, and uh, make sure that the flange of the airway is lying against the patient's lips, and then monitor the patient closely. So here it is going in backwards. Um, you may also use a tongue depressor or a rigid suction tip uh, to insert the oropharyngeal airway in directly, um, or just to displace soft tissue so that you can get it placed at all. Nasal pharyngeal airways, or nasal trumpets, are a soft, flexible tube that's inserted through the nostril into the hypopharynx. It, too, will move the tongue and soft tissue forward and provides a channel for air. Um, oftentimes, even patients with an intact gag reflex uh, may... Uh, taken a nasal pharyngeal airway like a stroke patient or a heavily intoxicated patient or head injured patient. Um, it's also good in patients whose jaws are clenched and you can't get their mouth opened. Uh, 
nasal pharyngeal airways are contraindicated if there is a cerebral spinal fluid leaking from the nose of the ears, and we'll talk about that uh, more in depth with uh, head injuries. Nasal pharyngeal airways come in different sizes. They're called French is the word for the size, so a 34 French or a 32 French, all the way down to a 28 French, and those are the typical adult sizes. When inserting a nasal pharyngeal airway, first you have to measure, just like you did the OPA, and it's really important that you lubricate, lubricate, lubricate uh, with a water-based lubricant like KY jelly um, or uh, KY jelly with uh, 2% xylocaine. Uh, before inserting this uh, into the nose. If you just take that dry, rigid uh, plastic tube and try to shove it up somebody's nose, um, you are going to cause trauma and significant nose bleeding. So here they are measuring the nasal pharyngeal airway. Uh, they're lubricating it with a water-soluble uh, gel. Um, you want to put their head into a neutral position uh, with a bevel towards the septum. You want to insert the nasal pharyngeal airway into the nostril and advance it, slowly twisting and pushing um, uh, until the flange of the nasal pharyngeal airway is up against the nostril. Uh, you want to pick the largest nair. Uh, it's typically the side uh, of the, you know, if they're right-handed, typically the right nair is larger than the left. But you want to pick the largest nostril uh, the, uh, of the two, and you want to put the largest airway that will fit in there uh, in that nostril. All right, so at some point in your course, uh, in your skills lab, you'll be able to practice the insertion of an oropharyngeal airway uh, and the insertion of a nasal pharyngeal airway. Uh, if you have any questions, uh, here's how to get a hold of me. Uh, with that, I'll uh, talk to you soon.